all set? Okay. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. We'll get started here. My name is Captain Marv Carlin. I'm the commanding officer of the Holy Cross uh, Naval ROTC Battalion, and welcome to our continued celebration of 50 years of co-education at Holy Cross. I would first like to give thanks to the College of Holy Cross, President Rougeau, who we just uh, met a few minutes ago, and Acting Dean Provost Anne-Marie Leschwitz for hosting us tonight as we honor uh, these trailblazing women. Also, thank you to Ms. Kristen Dyer and Alex Greeley with un uh, Alumni Relations for making this uh, evening happen and all of their coordination, so thank you very much. Lastly, I would like to give thank to, thanks to our Naval ROTC alumni sponsors, the O'Callaghan Society. Uh, we would have a very tough time doing what we do uh, in the Holy Cross Battalion if it wasn't for the O'Callaghan so Society and all the support that they give us, to us. Uh, tonight with us is the chairman of the O'Callaghan Society, Mr. Peter Malaseca. Uh, thank you, sir, for everything you do to help us out and you know, creating these young students to become uh, officers in the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps. So as I was writing some of my notes uh, today, I was sort of thinking, you know, wow, uh, you know, my notes started to get pretty long for this introduction, so I'll, I'll have to try to, you know, curtail some of um, these things before I, I, I start talking forever. But that's the sort of person that we have with us t tonight. So I think it was around 1996 or 1997 I had just checked into my, my first fleet squadron in San Diego, California. The, the squadron was uh, Helicopter Combat Support Squadron 3. So that was the fleet replacement squadron for the H-46 Sea Knight. So that's a tandem rotor helicopter that the Navy doesn't fly any, anymore. It was in that wardroom that I met the first fleet female pilot and flight instructor, then Lieutenant Nancy LaCour. So back in those days, there weren't that many uh, female pilots. Um, there definitely weren't uh, many female uh, flight instructors. Um, and honestly, back in those days, women were not always welcome in, in some of the aviation wardrooms. Uh, so we've definitely come a long way since those days. So not one to ever be idle. Admiral LaCour served countless assignments uh, that would take me another 10 minutes to list out. I won't do that, but however, I would be remiss if I didn't say a few, few uh, of her assignments that she's had that might spur some, some conversation later. Rear Admiral LaCour was mobilized to serve as the Chief of Key Leader Engagement at Headquarters International Security Assistance Force, Force, or ISAF, in Kabul, Afghanistan. And then in 2017, she was mobilized to serve as Commanding Officer at Camp Lemonnier, uh, Djibouti, and then where I caught back up with uh, Admiral LaCour, again, was her flag officer assignment as the Chief of Staff for Commander Naval Forces Europe and Africa. And then she was also the Vice Commander of U.S. Navy Sixth Fleet. Did a lot of travel, if I remember correctly. You were all over the place. Um, so as of June uh, of 2022, where Admiral LaCour has been serving as the 93rd Commandant of the Naval District Washington. However, and most importantly, Rear Admiral LaCour is a 1990 graduate of the College of the Holy Cross and was a member of the Holy Cross NROTC, uh, NROTC Battalion. And if I could tell one quick story, uh, years ago I was running a 5K in Norfolk and there were, uh, I was, uh, I thought I was in pretty good shape at the time, but there were two people that were in front of me and I noticed there were two female that were, were way off in the distance, they were the next people in front of me. And I tried really hard to catch up to him, and I, I never did. And I finally got up to the finish line, and who was it? It was Ramal LaCour that was in front of me, and then my, my then commanding officer, who was a commander, Tracy Melker. So I never caught up to him. I was gassed, and the, it was, they were fast. So always impressive. I, I still remember that today. So I tell that story because Rebel LaCour is a, what I would uh, say is a true Renaissance woman. In addition to all these accomplishments, she's also the mother of six amazing kids. And we used to make jokes that she used to have her own basketball team. I, I think we, we would say that all the time. So, and, and in addition to that, I also served in the squadron with her uh, husband, Commander Patrick LaCour, Pat LaCour. Um, and he was an uh, amazing, amazing pilot and a great department head at the squadron that we were both in. 
So my wife and I, on countless occasions, and I'm sure I'm not the only officer that has said this or, and, and person that knows Admiral LaCour, we would always say, how does she do it all? Because it's truly to have six kids and all these jobs, truly, truly amazing. So all over these years, I've admired her energy, intelligence, her definite support to Navy veterans, you know, through her valor, valor runs that she's done in the past, the legacy of her children that are currently serving in the military and her commitment to her, to her family, and of course, her leadership to all of us. Oh, and her 5Ks, her 5K running, definitely. So please help me give a warm Holy Cross welcome to our very own alumni, Rear Admiral Nancy LaCour, United States Navy. That was a very generous introduction. Thank you, I appreciate it, Marv. And it's good to see you again. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you uh, for being here, whether you're here in the room or joining us virtually. It's uh, really exciting to be here celebrating 50, or 50 years of women at Holy Cross. Uh, I must confess, though, that midshipman fourth class Stuart would be shocked to see me here in front of you. Maybe the only people who would have been more shocked than the midshipman me would be, would be my NROTC battalion leadership at the time. You see, during my first semester in ROTC, the freshmen had indoctrination training every Saturday morning from 6 a.m. to noon for the entire first semester. And my nerves were getting the best of me before that very first indoc drill period. So a longtime neighborhood friend from Albany, a few years ahead of me here at Holy Cross, took me out on Friday night to settle my nerves. Let's just say that I was not in the best shape for drill the following day, nor was I on time. In fact, I showed up exactly five hours late for which I was rewarded with an inordinate number of push-ups. So if this is resonating with any of the midshipmen in the audience, fear not. Just because things might not be going well in ROTC all the time doesn't mean you can't move on and have a successful career in the Navy uh, as, and as long as you learn from your mistakes. And I promise you I learned my lesson and to this day I still offer second chances to folks. But in all sincerity, I truly am honored to be here um, to celebrate 50 years of co-education and I'm humbled to be included in such an impactful series of commemorative events. Today I'm gonna to talk about my life, career, and lessons that I've learned in the 33 years since I left Mount St. James. But first, I think it's important to acknowledge how we got here, able to celebrate 50 years of women at Holy Cross, and coincidentally, 50 years of women in naval aviation. As a helicopter pilot, I am supported by a skilled maintenance crew who, whose work occurs long before go time but it's absolutely critical to take off. Similarly, my achievements rest upon the solid foundation built by those who came before me here at Holy Cross and in naval aviation. There are people, men and women alike, who fought for equality and opportunity for women, paving the way for women like me to benefit from an excellent liberal arts education and to take to the skies. I am forever grateful for the foresight, the courage, and the determination of these men and women, and I constantly remind myself that I stand on their shoulders with each step in my career. It might seem odd to begin a speech celebrating 50 years of women at Holy Cross by talking about men, but hear me out. It took men, along with the advocacy of women, to open the doors for us, men who changed policies and began to turn the tide of integration. I will start by talking about three men who made today's celebration possible. I'm sure the gentleman on the left is a familiar face to most of you, Reverend John Brooks is a legend here, and he was a man with an extraordinary vision. He believed that women deserve the same opportunity as men, and that Holy Cross, an all-male college since 1843, would be a better place if it was more diverse. He was determined to make it happen despite the resistance he knew he would face. In the early 70s, many if not most colleges in the United States were still single-sex institutions. But Reverend Brooks knew that change was coming, with the civil rights and the women's rights movements gaining momentum he knew that Holy Cross needed to adapt to the times. He knew he needed to persuade people to show them that diversity was not just a buzzword, but an imperative if Holy Cross were to remain a, re a relevant and vibrant institution for years to come. And he succeeded. In 1972, Holy Cross announced that it would admit women, becoming one of the first all-male colleges in the United States to do so. Father Brooks knew that this change would meet resistance, and he was right. There were plenty of dissenters, but the largest uproar came from alumni. And when an alumnus asked if admitting women meant fewer sons would be admitted, Reverend, Re Reverend Brooks had the perfect response. 
He said, my only advice to you is to sire sons that get 650s on the SAT. In other words, the college would focus on educating America's brightest and most promising future leaders, not just the sons of alumni. Thanks to his vision and determination, women have been pursuing the top liberal arts education available here at Holy Cross, building a foundation for, um, that has enabled success at, across a myriad of fields. Holy Cross continues to prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion in all aspects of its community, and Reverend Brooks's legacy lives on. Now I'm gonna introduce you to a man whose vision changed the direction of integration in the Navy. As I mentioned earlier, we're also celebrating 50 years of women in naval aviation this year. And the Navy honored this milestone with their first all-women flyover during the Super Bowl. I'm sure many of you saw that. It was pretty well advertised. And what an inspirational display of our top aviation talent. From the early days of flight, women have been part of the aviation community. But it wasn't until the 70s that the US Navy began to allow women to train and to serve as pilots. The Navy was in the midst of a cultural shift because the Vietnam War raged on and it became clear that we were gonna to continue to need pilots, but the pool of available pilots was drying up. And that's where Admiral Elmo Zumwalt comes in. Admiral Zumwalt is a legendary naval leader, the youngest person ever to achieve the rank of four star and the youngest person ever to serve as the chief of naval operations. He was a staunch advocate for allowing women to serve in all capacities in the Navy. But Admiral Zumwalt's true legacy, at least in my personal opinion, is that in 1971, he opened aviation training to women. It was a groundbreaking decision that sparked controversy and resistance from some members of the military and the public. Opponents argued that women were not physically capable of flying combat aircraft, that women were not suited for the demanding and stressful nature of aviation, and that women would be a distraction to the male pilots. Some even voiced concern that the Navy would have to lower the standards in order to bring women into the aviation community as pilots. Despite all of these objections, Admiral Zumwalt pushed forward with his plan to integrate women into naval aviation. And as women proved themselves to be capable aviators, attitudes shifted and they met less resistance. Admiral Zumwalt's legacy lives on today in the thousands of women who continue to serve in the US Navy, especially those of us in naval aviation. The last story is personal. I'm gonna introduce you to someone who wasn't a policymaker nor a visionary organizational leader. I'm gonna talk about my father and his gender blind advocacy. First, a quick anecdote about my dad, a Holy Cross NROTC graduate, graduate who spent five years serving in the Navy. Holy Cross and the Navy were unequivocally my father's passions. He lit up when we talked about either of these topics. And rarely was he seen without a ball cap. He always had a baseball cap on. And the favorites in the rotation were a purple Crusader hat, a Holy Cross NROTC hat, and a USS Kalamazoo hat. That was the first ship I deployed on. A bigger fan of the Navy and Holy Cross you will never find. I attribute my decision to join the Navy to my dad, who encouraged me to think about service in the late 80s, arguably a time when it was uncommon for women to join the military. I probably never would have considered it otherwise. Certainly none of my friends from my private all-girls Catholic high school were pursuing a similar path. It was a time when news headlines about women in the military included negative stereotypes, and women only accounted for 10% of the military. But whenever my father talked to me about the military, well, let's be honest, he mostly talked to me about the Navy. My gender was never part of the discussion. He never gave me any reason to think that being a woman would hold me back. Because of his own naval service, my father knew exactly what I was getting into. He believed I had the skills that would be welcome in the Navy and would enable me to succeed. Looking back, I realized that my father's support was not just a sign of his commitment to me as his daughter, but a testament to his gender-blind view of talent and service. As a daughter, a wife, and a mother, to men who serve, it fills me with pride to talk about the role that men have played in breaking down barriers for women in the military over the past half century. Men like Admiral Zumwalt and Reverend Brooks took bold steps to change policies in the Navy and here at Holy Cross, paving the way for women to reach new heights. And it's not just those in high positions of power who've made a difference. Alumni and veterans like my father share their experiences and encouragement with women, making us feel welcome and supported. My father could have focused his recruiting efforts solely on my brother, it would have been perfectly acceptable for him to gravitate towards encouraging his son to join the service, but he didn't. And because of that, I stand before you wearing a uniform I never imagined I'd be wearing. And this has shaped how I mentor throughout my career. I'm deliberate about giving my time and attention not only to women, but, uh, but also to those who look and think differently than I do. The strength of the Navy is in our diversity, our diversity of thought, education, and background, but we also need diversity that's visible 
like gender and ethnicity because junior sailors need to see leaders in high positions who look like themselves. As the saying goes, if I can see it, I can be it. Speaking of women in high positions, I've had the honor of serving alongside some incredible Navy women who paved the way for others like me to follow in their footsteps. Being the first can be difficult. It can be lonely. The first to climb, the first to the wall must climb over with little or no help. Sometimes when they make it over the wall, they're so tired and stressed that all they can do is look ahead and think about the next wall. Sometimes though, those firsts climb over the wall and they set a ladder behind them so that it's easier for others to follow in their footsteps. Sometimes the firsts climb over the wall and then they turn around and they lend a hand to those trying to climb over the wall. Both types of firsts take on a burden for the rest of us. As I said earlier, it's never lost on me that I stand on the shoulders of giants. In my career, I'm grateful to have had the chance to meet and serve with several firsts who set ladders or pulled others over the wall. Among these women are Rear Admiral Retired Wendy Carpenter and Admiral Lisa Franchetti. Wendy Carpenter was a trailblazer for women in naval aviation, becoming the first woman aviator to be promoted to Admiral in the US Navy. She was not only accomplished, but approachable and encouraging. She was a leader who made things easier for all of us in her wake. Back in 2009, when I was a commander, a male mentor of mine encouraged me to reach out to Admiral Carpenter to schedule an office call, like a mentoring session. And I was reluctant. I was aware that many of my male peers routinely sought office calls with admirals, but that sometimes came across as self-promoting. Eventually, my mentor convinced me, and I, and I did that. I reached out to her. I soon had my first one-on-one -on -one with an admiral. Not only an admiral, but a female aviator admiral. And not only had I never met a female aviator admiral, I didn't even know one existed until that time. Admiral Carpenter welcomed me into her office with open arms. She mentored me and she talked to me about how she handled the competing demands of motherhood and service. But even more important than being a mentor, she was a sponsor. Admiral Carpenter had a seat at the table with the senior leaders in our community. And when discussions about jobs or opportunities arose, she made sure my name was on the list of qualified candidates. She even found a place for me on her staff, which gave me visibility up to the highest level of the Navy with the Chief of Naval Operations. Admiral Carpenter not only left the ladder on the other side of the wall, but she made sure I was in a position to climb it. The next leader you see here is Admiral Lisa Franchetti. Admiral Franchetti is one of only two women in the history of our Navy to reach the rank of four-star admiral. Admiral Franchetti has excelled in the most demanding jobs, many of those at sea, from commander of a ship, to a strike group, to a numbered fleet, to now leading as a second in command of our Navy as the Vice Chief of Naval Operations. One of the most significant lessons I learned from her was very subtle and hard to ar articulate exactly. By observing her while she was a three-star fleet commander, I suddenly felt as though I had been given a pass to bring my role as a mother into work in a way that I had not done before. It's not that I ever hid being a mother, just the opposite in fact. People who worked for me knew I was a mom because I often use kid stories to illustrate points with my team. But as a br brand new admiral, I wasn't sure how parenthood was going to fit into my new role. There just simply weren't a lot of examples of mothers senior to me until I worked for Admiral Frank Hetty. What I observed and what profoundly impacted me when I worked for her at Sixth Fleet was that her calendar was public for key staff members to view. And on her calendar were things like swim meets and back to school nights. Of course, there were Navy requirements that took priority over these at times, but it was clear that she was comfortable prioritizing family events whenever possible. Her public calendar was inspiring and freeing to me. It sent a clear signal that family didn't have to take a back seat to the Navy, at least not all the time. Emma Franchetti left the ladder. There were, of course, times when work interrupted her personal plans. She was a fleet commander after all, but she did what she could to place her family first. And I now manage my schedule in the same way, encouraging the men and women on my team to do, to do the same. We're only productive at work if we're healthy at home. We are whole people with lives, families, and interests outside of the Navy, and those things are essential to our overall well-being. These women, along with many others, paved the way for women like me. Thanks to their trailblazing efforts and contributions from men like Admiral Zumwalt and Father Brooks, I've had the privilege of serving the United States Navy for almost 33 years. To give you a glimpse of my Navy journey, the team put together a video highlighting some of the things I've been fortunate to experience uh, in my time since uh, graduating from here. Picture is worth a thousand words, so I'll let the video tell the story.
fantastic job. I got a very talented crew <laughs> on my team. So um, now that you've seen a literal highlight uh, reel of my career, I'm going to tell you three stories about the quiet moments that don't make it into an official biography, but ones that have shaped my career and leadership style. While I thoroughly enjoyed flying, being in command, and participating in international engagements and ceremonies, those things did not define my success. Success for me was when I made career decisions, career decisions based on my own personal values, when I led authentically, and when I experienced a culture in which everyone felt valued and supported. The first story is about knowing what you value in life and remaining true to those values. After graduating from here, I went on to earn my wings as a Navy pilot, and I had found my calling. I loved flying, and I was proud to serve my country as part of a growing community of female aviators in the Navy. I loved all of it, going to sea, meeting sailors, flying challenging missions, and the camaraderie of an operational squadron. And to be honest, to flying in a battle group of 5,000 sailors as one of just two women was not terrible. Of course, I was single and in my 20s at the time. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not all about work. We have lives and dreams outside of the Navy, of what the Navy can provide, in my case, a family. And this is what drove many of my career decisions in the Navy. I progressed in my career and started a family with my husband, Pat, also a helicopter pilot. Then I came to the realization that having two successful aviation careers and a family might be harder than I hoped. There were several things working against us. It was challenging to get orders that would allow both of us to have competitive jobs in the same location. And being assigned to the same command was not allowed. Frequent deployments and moves were challenging, and having children meant I would face significant time out of the cockpit. My squadron leadership did their best to help us work through all of these challenges. But in my heart, I knew I was probably going to have to sacrifice one of my dreams. So after much soul searching and the birth of my first child, I made the difficult decision to transition off active duty. It wasn't a decision I took lightly, and it was not made because of mistreatment or discrimination. In fact, I was hand-selected for some of the most competitive flying jobs because I was a woman. Regardless, it was a hard decision for me to walk away from flying, a career that I loved, and one that was going well. What I didn't realize at that time, however, is that I could still have a successful career in the Navy. It wasn't going to include flying helicopters anymore, but many unique opportunities awaited me in the Navy Reserve, opportunities that allowed me to put my family first. The best thing about the Reserve was that it afforded me an exceptional amount of flexibility in my Navy career. While I was busy at home with six kids under the age of 10, I made sure I met my minimum obligations, but I didn't do a whole lot more than that. However, as the kids reached school age, I was able to go all in. I even gave up my civilian job so I could focus on my Navy career. And rather than the minimum one week in a month, two weeks a year, I was in uniform over 200 days a year, sometimes back in active duty for extended periods of time. I was able to take on competitive and high-impact leadership billets, like leading diplomatic engagements for U.S. and NATO generals in Afghanistan, and then later commanding the only U.S. base on the continent of Africa. But I was still able to put my family first. Thankfully, I had a true full-time parenting partner in Pat. We worked as a team to make sure our six kids always had stability as they grew up. There were times when I was gone, and there were times when Pat was gone, and although our kids may not have had as much mom and dad time as their friends, we ensured that time they did have was quality time. While life does not always go as planned, if you make decisions based on your values, things have a way of working out. For me, this meant hanging up my flight suit to put family first. It didn't mean losing sight of my career aspirations completely. I just needed to be open to different avenues. My Navy career hasn't been the path I imagined when I was a new helicopter pilot, but it has been an incredible ride. Next story is about authenticity. I distinctly remember the first time I was mentored. I was in advanced flight training for helicopters, and one of the instructors I had flown with several times offered some well-intentioned but misguided advice. He told me, Nancy, you're a great pilot, but you're never going to make it in the Navy. You're not tough enough. His words stung, and I really didn't know what to make of his unsolicited advice. On one hand, I was offended that he thought I wasn't cut out for the Navy. On the other hand, I wondered he was, if he was on for, onto something. I thought I was tough, but then again, I had never really been tested. I knew I was soft-spoken, and I didn't think that was going to change. I was generally kind to others, and that wasn't going to change either. To think that I might fail, not because of my talent, but because of my personality, was a tough pill to swallow. And knowing I was walking in into, into an environment where, as a woman, I would have many eyes on me, I was genuinely concerned. So I reflected on his words for a while, and then I moved on and decided it was a pill I didn't have to take. We all bring something different to the table. Some leaders are, cheer or some leaders, are cheerleaders, always sharing energetic, mo motivational words. Others command attention with a booming voice or a stern look. I'm not one of those leaders. 
There were times, however, early in my career where I tried to be that type of leader, and I failed because I was not being authentic. I lead with calmness, directness, and empathy. This mix works for me because it's aligned with my true personality. There's no blueprint for leadership in the military or anywhere else. We all have our own mix of unique strengths and talents that we bring strengths and talents that we bring to the table. When I engage with young sailors or midshipmen like all the ones here, I'm often asked for leadership advice and I always say, be true to yourself. If you're a gregarious cheerleader, lean into that. If you're a straightforward communicator, there's a place for you. If like me, you prefer to listen and observe before speaking up, we need you on our team. Don't try to fit yourself into someone else's leadership model. Authenticity is essential. Final story is about integration and inclusion. Integration means simply allowing women to, to serve alongside men in all roles and capacities. It means opening closed doors and breaking down barriers. Policymakers like Admiral Zumwalt and Reverend Brooks laid the groundwork for the integration of women in their organizations, an important step towards inclusion. Inclusion, however, is about creating a culture where everyone is valued. It means ensuring that all sailors, regardless, regardless of gender, race, or background, feel like they are part of the team and they are invited to contribute their unique perspectives and skills. Let me give you an example of what inclusion is not. A few years ago, I attended a two-week leadership training program for installation commanding officers in Washington, D.C. I was the only woman in the group of about 35, which is not an uncommon experience for me as, um, it, at that point in my career. However, what stood out to me this time was a tangible lack of inclusion. Every evening as the day's training came to an end, I could hear the guys in the class making plans to catch a baseball game, grab dinner, or enjoy some scotch and cigars. And while scotch and cigars is not my idea of a fun evening, I couldn't help but feel like an outsider when night after night I wasn't invited along. But I didn't dwell on it and I didn't hold it against them. However, as an introvert, that sense of being an outsider didn't inspire me to contribute to my ideas to the group discussions. In retrospect, it was a missed opportunity for me and for them because who knows what direction our discussions may have taken with a different point of view expressed. This experience solidified in my mind the difference between integration and inclusion. Policy dictates integration, but each of us has a role in creating a culture of inclusion and ensuring everyone feels valued. Tonight I talked about some of the men who set policy for integration, some of the women who were first in the Navy, and I told you a few stories from my career that highlight different things I'm passionate about. I want to close by saying I'm incredibly optimistic about the future of our Navy. I had a chance to talk with many of you this evening, and it was a joy. I'm always overwhelmed with pride and awe when I meet young men and women who, like my son, are choosing to serve in the military when there's a world of options available to them that might be easier and more lucrative. As a mother of six, I have a front row seat to the leaders of tomorrow, and let me tell you, they have demands. <laughs> a lot of them, yeah. <laughs> they demand inclusion fair treatment, and work-life integration. And those demands keep the Navy, as an employer, on its toes. We are always looking for innovative ways to recruit and retain the best talent that our nation has to offer. The Navy today has more opportunities available to women than ever before, including service in submarines and special warfare. 18 months ago, a female sailor completed the grueling 37-week training course for the first time to become a Naval Special Warfare combatant, combatant craft crewman. Some of you might know this as SWIC. We also have the first woman commanding an aircraft carrier. We have a long way to go in the, to have a Navy that reflects the diverse population of the United States. But the Navy's focused on cultivating inclusion and further diversifying our force. And the people working these initiatives are doing so with genuine care and a true passion for change. As a woman who served for 33 years in the world's greatest Navy, the strongest testimony I can give is to say that I would be proud to have any of my five daughters follow in my footsteps. Thank you for your time and attention this evening, and thank you to the administration here at Holy Cross for inviting me to help celebrate 50 years of co-education. So we'll open up to uh, questions for, for the group. So probably to help out Mitchum and Gamboa, just raise your hand. All right, somebody at dinner tonight asked me a question that maybe I'll just share with all of you. Somebody said, what, 
what do you wish you knew, or what do you wish, what do I wish I knew when I was in your shoes about the Navy? Um, it took me a while to come to realize. And I think I, t I touched on it a little bit tonight. I think is the fact that you ha there are different paths in the Navy. I knew nothing about the reserve w when I joined the Navy. I never even thought that was gonna be something I would do. Um, and I wish I had known that because it, it really made that decision to leave active duty so much harder because I had no idea what being in the reserve component would, would mean. And it's a, uh, it's a great career opportunity. We really need to look at it as a continuum of service. We're not losing somebody, we're keeping somebody that we spent, in my case, 10 years training. Right? So they're keeping me in the Navy for another 23 years as opposed to me just walking away after 10 years. So. Good evening, ma'am. I'm a midshipman fourth class trainer. And I was just wondering, what's the biggest challenge you faced during your uh, career? And what is something you learned from that? Um, biggest challenge I faced, obviously, as a, as a mother, <laughs> Uh, I think le leaving your family for the first time was probably the biggest challenge. Um, it, I was used to doing a lot. I was very hands-on. And my, like I said, Pat was, Pat was all in. He was, he's great. But I'm the mom. <laughs> and I like things done a certain way with my kids. And so it taught me, when I, when I left them and went to Afghanistan, it taught me um, it didn't have to be done my way. You know, it, it could be done anyway. As long as I had all six kids when I got home, <laughs> be, I think we'd be okay. <laughs> so that, that, that was probably one of the biggest things for me as a mom. Good evening, ma'am, midshipman first class Basil. Is there anything specific about your experience at Holy Cross that sticks out to you that helped you with your future as a naval officer? So I would say the liberal arts education really forces you to think and to question. And that is critical, you know, particularly as you get higher up in, in, the, in the military. Uh, when, you're, when you're at your tactical level, you, you don't want to do a whole lot of questioning because things have to be done by the book, you know, uh, at that level. But as you get up, you know, to operational and then into the strategic level, being able to question things, uh, I think, is, is key. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so when we're talking 5th, 6th Fleet, uh, for the majority of my career, it's been 5th Fleet, right? Everybody, the ARGs, the ARG Muse, they go to 5th Fleet. Even when they're in 6th Fleet, 5th Fleet requests them and they get pulled. Uh, do you see a shift happening or has a shift happened uh, lately? Do you expect that shift to happen more towards 6th Fleet now that we have left the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh, absolutely, yeah, I do. And, and I think uh, the Russia-Ukraine situation is certainly... Uh, helped <laughs> with our case. It was always, it was hard to be at Sixth Fleet and watch every ship just sail on through, go to Fifth Fleet, um, because there's a lot to be done, even, even not in a, in a conflict like we have going on with Russia and Ukraine, but, but the engagement with all our NATO partners is critical, and so to have the, the Navy and the Marine Corps there um, is really important, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Thank you. Even man, uh, ma'am, I'm just been sent class Christmas. Obviously, there's like a big recruiting crisis going on right now. What would you say to high schoolers now, like today, um, to try and tell them like what are the benefits of the military, like why they should choose to serve, why they should like look into anything? What would you tell them? <laughs> <laughs> You're doing I, it. I have some ideas myself, ma'am. Yeah. Well, what are your ideas? What do you think? Uh, I would tell them that, especially nowadays, with I mean, this might be a very unpopular opinion, but with um, the internet and a lot of I would say ease of life. I think the military has a, from what I've learned from all the senior officers that enlisted, it like toughens you up a little bit, teaches you how to like go through life, be mentally resilient. I would say there's a lot of benefits. It helps out obviously like with practical applications to the workplace. Uh, and finally, I think it's just, it gives you a sense of purpose because I think humans need to have something higher than themselves to serve in order to fully fulfill like our purpose on the earth is my opinion there. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't have said it any better, honestly. Um, oh, yeah, yeah you're, you're absolutely right. It is a very challenging environment for, for all the services right now. Um, and I, see, I think you've even seen that here as the size of the unit you know, gets a little bit smaller every year. So um, it's tough. The, the people that we can recruit from, that, that population is, is like drastically smaller and shrinking all the time for a variety of reasons, whether it's mental health or, or drug use or I just don't care you know, <laughs> type attitude. We just don't have a lot of people to recruit from. So it's critical that people tell their story. 
and tell their story in a positive way. People who are having positive experiences in the Navy need to tell that story. And so, that, I mean, that's why I I'm all, like love events like this where I can tell my story. Of course, I'm telling it to people who are going into the Navy anyway, but um, I take advantage of other opportunities too. Um, so if that's you know, if you guys can do that, you know, make sure you're echoing your, your great stories. And I know you've done some fun training already in the summers, so letting people know about that. And I, I don't think you can uh, the benefits. I don't think you can beat them, honestly. So thank you for your thank question. you, ma'am. Yep. I'm not going to say my year. Okay. <laughs> um, a lot of what you spoke of was your family and your family's experience in the service, and a lot of midshipmen have them. We have communities out there who don't have that. How do we make the services attractive to them? To people without families, supporting families? Without, without, who don't have families who have experience in the service. Right. Because most of Everybody here right. has somebody. They have a connection in the service. Right. How do we yes. do it for those that don't? Yeah, so um, I was at a conference last week talking talking about this, about how, how the Navy got, and maybe the other service had the same problem. The Navy got away from that, and we were basically relying on, you know, the, the friend network to bring people in. And so we're trying to uh, pivot back to some of the old recruiting ways that we used to do, um, targeting, like, parents of kids, p community leaders, high schools that will influence kids who have no connection to it. So anytime somebody like me, anytime an admiral is on the road, they've asked us to go find a JROTC unit, go find a high school, go find a community college, and talk to them about our experience. So um, it's, it's, we're playing hardball right now, trying to get those folks in. Good evening, ma'am. Michigan Third Class May. Uh, what do you think is one of the most rewarding experiences that you've had since being in the Navy? I don't know how you could possibly pick one. <laughs> um, the, I mean, the, I think hands down the best experience and most fun you'll ever have is your first operational tour, whether that's on a ship, flying in helicopters, whatever that is. That is hands down probably the most fun you'll ever have because you really just get to, to do your thing, right, with not a lot of other strings attached. Um, but... I've certainly had many, many rewarding, you know, opportunities. Uh, many of them overseas, which is really unique um, and that's eye-opening and really, really gives you an appreciation for what we have back here in the United States in a way that that you just don't get <laughs> when you're when you're when you haven't left the the country here. So, yeah, I think um, I think being overseas a lot is, has also been super rewarding, um, challenging too, of course, but. I, and bringing my family, we, we were able to bring the family, or part of the family, um, over to Italy, uh, where I was working with Marv, and that was really a fantastic opportunity for them. So I know some of you are going overseas after, after you get commissioned, so uh, take advantage of it. I think you'll, uh, uh, you'll appreciate the other cultures, but you'll also come back here and appreciate our culture a lot more. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, Mitchum in third class, McGeever. Ma'am, you spoke a lot about um, many challenges that you overcame throughout your career, um, maybe still um, going through. And uh, what, what would be the, like, you spoke a lot about um, when you were a uh, young J.O. having to make your personality work and mm -hmm. um, testing out different personalities. And, like, what would be the, what was your, like, inner voice to um, help you stay on that path. Obviously, you said you tried things and, and failed, but um, that like self-talk that um, maybe you had as a young J.O. And, and still have to this day. Yeah, I mean, I, I really do think it was a lot of self-talk. Um, and the reason I had to come from within was, uh, I think, being a woman, we, we, there, was, there were so few of us. And at that time in aviation, you really did not try to congregate and get together as women. You just, you just wanted to be a pilot. You wanted to be a good pilot. You put your head down and you did your job. And so, um, and that wasn't, I wasn't going to own up to like all my weaknesses to all the guys, right? I might have had that you know, that conversation with the women, but we just didn't uh, separate ourselves like that. So it was, it was a lot of self-talk. Um, you know, I, I would go, talking with my dad too was certainly helpful. Um, but, you know, it would get you down. Like there are certainly times when you question yourself and you doubt yourself, sometimes for extended periods of time. And sometimes at a very high rank too, I've doubted myself and doubted my abilities, but... Um, like I said, if you can just kind of recage yourself and get back to what you truly believe is you and what you value, I think it all starts to come together again. Running out of questions. 
français. Uh, Peter Von Lesko, I'm chair of the O'Callaghan Society. Um, your experience in the Navy has been uh, in the flying community, but there are also lots of other communities, the surface warfare, submarine special operations. Um, do you think that those other communities would offer the same flexibility that you enjoyed throughout your career? Um, so I didn't enjoy the flexibility, so I went reserve. Uh, and, and I would say yes. All of those pipelines, if once you transition off active duty, you are afforded a significant amount of flexibility in your career. For all of those pipelines on active duty, they're tough. There are milestones you have to meet, right? And, and sometimes it's just, it's hard on a family and it's hard uh, as the only person in a family who can have the baby. Like, you know, right. it, it's a challenge. <laughs> so it's just uh, biology factors right there. But. Um, Still, I think that even um, even though it's challenging, there's always like the Navy's always looking for ways to make it better. We're always looking for policies that can try to help and give people a little more freedom. The problem is, I personally don't think there's ever one policy that's going to make it Anything. make it better for everybody. It, you know, if we were a private company and we could hand tailor policy to people, you know, one one individual at a time, it'd be great. I think we'd have a much better retention, but we can't, unfortunately. So, I mean, we're, we're always getting creative, we're always listening and, and trying to do things that'll make, uh, make, make their lives better, you know, for sailors. Good evening, ma'am, midshipman, second class Ives. Um, do you find it difficult to move up in the ranks as a female with your experience in the Navy? And if so, did you have specific times that like uh, policies of the Navy that helped you fall back onto it or like specific people that helped you fall back to really that? I honestly feel that my gender has played not one single um, role in, in how I progressed throughout the Navy. I mean, there were challenges associated with for sure, but uh, it was never an impediment. Uh, and if, if you look at the way we do promotion boards, and I've done a lot of promotion boards, they are 100% uh, equitable. And I think it's, it's solely based on performance. I am very, very confident about that, that the Navy's really doing the right job there. Um, like I said, there were, there, were up, there were times in my career where, oh, you really, you're a woman, we really like to have a woman in this role, and, and that does happen, you know. Um, it happens to men in different cases, too. But, you know, it's all, it's all part of the game. Like I said, it's important that we do have people in places that look like, you know, <laughs> that we can see some people in those places. So, you know, so when they're like, oh, we need to have a female flight instructor, Okay, I get it. <laughs> wasn't wasn't what I wanted to do, but yeah, I get it. You know, we are in the military after all, right? So, thank you, ma'am. Think that? I think we're done. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for uh, the sarcasm. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Oh, it's absolutely. great to hear your it's perspective on it career in the Navy. As chairman of the uh, O'Callaghan Society, I'd like to close the uh, event this evening, thanking you again for joining us and thanking uh, the staff at Holy Cross for making this happen and coordinating all the technical <laughs> stuff, details behind us. Thank you, Kristen and Alex. Appreciate it. So um, I I'll wish everybody a great evening and thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, I really do appreciate it. Hopefully you'll join us one day. I will. I will. I'll be back in here for commissions. Yes, I'll be there. <laughs>